Lincoln's Renaissance period is officially over. It's not a sedan brand anymore, and the timing couldn't be better. It wasn't really working anyway, so it decided to scrap them completely from the lineup. The MKZ's gone, and the Continental got the axe too again. Now it's a time of reinvention and rejuvenation, and it all starts with this Corsair. Right out of the gate, I'm going to tell you that as the point of entry to the Lincoln brand, the Corsair is way better than any sedan that came before it anyway. And as Lincoln reinvents itself as an all SUV brand, this is a great place to start. But before we dive into the particulars about the Corsair, let's talk about the Lincoln brand in general. And you know, it is going to compete with automakers like Mercedes, BMW, and Genesis by default because they're all priced about the same way and they're all classified as premium automakers. But Lincoln really has its own thing going on. And the best way to look at it is that this is kind of the way that luxury used to be before driving dynamics got mixed in and really muddied the waters a little bit. Now, don't get me wrong, there is still a very big place in the market for that Luxo Sport vibe. But if you're looking for a bit of that old school premium feel without the performance, this is a great place to start. Part of the way forward for Lincoln is learning from past mistakes. It can't just build rebadged Fords and expect people to buy them. The products have to be unique, but that doesn't mean that you should worry that this thing shares its underpinnings with the Ford Escape. Sharing platforms and powertrains is totally fine as long as the vehicles look and feel different. And this Corsair is definitely different from anything in the Ford portfolio. I've spent my fair share of time in the latest version of the Escape to become fairly familiar with it, and I can safely say that about the only thing the Corsair has in common with that Ford is the way the transmission behaves. It's just kind of clunky when it changes gears, especially with the drive mode in its eco setting. And that is a bit of a shame for a few reasons. I mean, I've experienced it before, and it looks like it's pretty well documented, so it's too bad that Ford hasn't addressed that. And who knows, maybe it's fine with the larger 2.3 liter engine that you can get in the Corsair, but I'm definitely experiencing it with the two liter that's powering this thing. And speaking of that two liter, I'm totally fine that I have the smaller motor in here and for a couple different reasons. Now, one thing I will point out, both of them are rated at the same 9.8 liters per 100 kilometers combined, and both of them have the same 3000 pound towing capacity. But if you do plan to tow, I would probably recommend opting for that larger engine for the extra grunt you get with all that extra torque. It's one of those things that you're not really going to need it every day, but when you go to pull a couple jet skis out of the water, you're going to appreciate that extra grunt. So why do I prefer the two liter? Well, it's cheaper. Let's just take a look at the base version. You can only get it with a two liter and it starts at about 45,000 bucks. If you step up to this reserve model, well, it's about $50,500 with the two liter under the hood and about 56 grand with that 2.3 liter. That extra money does include some extra features, but again, that is a lot of money to pay for something that most people probably aren't going to need. And this two liter does spin up plenty of output anyway. It makes the same 250 horsepower and 280 pound feet of torque that you get in the Escape. If that's not enough for you, I don't know what is. This is a small SUV after all. Don't forget that fact. And yes, there is a bit of turbo lag off the top, but it's going to give you plenty of passing power when you need it. And it is pretty smooth. It's only that transmission that causes trouble. Something else about this two liter you might like, it makes a little bit more output than the base engine in the Porsche Macan. I know that's not good for much, but it is good for bragging rights. And another nice thing about this, it can run on regular grade gas. Now, premium is recommended, and that's how you're going to maximize your fuel efficiency and output. But if you're looking to save a few bucks, you can stick 87 octane in the tank without penalty. So again, that's just another point in favor of this powertrain. The only issue is that transmission, and it's not just those clunky gear changes, but just in general, it doesn't feel as refined as a gearbox in a premium vehicle should, but the ride quality is superb. And a big reason why are these upgraded adaptive dampers I have in this version I'm testing. 
If you're gonna shell out for only one upgrade in the Corsair, make it these dampers. For 1,250 bucks, you can't go wrong. And it's only these massive 20 inch wheels that really amplify and exaggerate bumps and cracks in the road. But otherwise, this thing is silky smooth. And the same goes with this steering. There's not much resistance to it, but it is buttery smooth. It's very compliant and that's what you want. Again, old school luxury. It's not tight and sporty. It's smooth, it's comfortable, and it's relaxed. This is the way an old luxury vehicle was and it's nice to see that you can still get it today. All of that stuff is perfectly tailored to the character of the Corsair and cruising around in this thing is like driving your mattress. It's very comfortable. About the only issue I've noticed on that front is there is just a little too much wind noise coming from around these massive door mirrors. But otherwise, this is a very nice cabin to hang out in. As far as little SUVs like this are concerned, I'd say the Corsair is off to a pretty good start. It knows what it needs to be and maybe more importantly, what it doesn't, and it sticks to that pretty closely. If I were shopping in this segment, I'd give it a look at the very least, though I would have some questions about this cabin. Now, don't get me wrong, for the most part, it looks and feels the part of a premium vehicle. This leather in particular is fantastic, and my camera guy loves the color of this tan, but you can also get it in blue, which is awesome to see. It really spices things up a bit, but it's some of the other stuff in here. Take the plastic that's used to make these paddle shifters. It has no place in anything with a premium badge on it. And the same goes with all this piano black plastic everywhere. It's that typical American automaker interpretation of what a luxury vehicle should be. And it's a swing and a miss. I don't think it's luxurious at all. And all it does is attract fingerprints and smudges. The other problem I have in here, this touchscreen really does look like an afterthought with the way it's just slapped to the dash like this. And it's not very big, though I will point out that the infotainment system itself is very easy to use. And I also appreciate that Lincoln stuck with traditional buttons and switches in here instead of going to touch controls. The only one I have a problem with, the fact that it uses buttons for the gear selector. I hate these systems and I wish they would go away like they did years ago with the Edsel. Failed experiment in my books. And there are a few other problems in here. Now, I know this is a small SUV, but I'm just not sold on the cargo space. On paper, it's supposed to have a little bit more room than the Mercedes GLC back here, but I think it's actually got a little bit less. And then the other problem is this liftover height is quite high, so you've really got to lug heavy items up and over the bumper. It's not that it's totally unusable, but I do wish it were a little bit more practical behind the back seats. So this thing doesn't lead the segment when it comes to cargo capacity, but it's got tons of room for moving people and it is very practical. Just look at this front row, very spacious. And the big one is the shoulder room. It's nice and wide up here. So you don't feel like you're sitting too close to the person next to you. And that second row is fantastic. Lincoln did a great job of maximizing the space back there. And the other cool thing is that row of seats is on rails, so you can slide it forward or back if you want more room for your stuff or for people. The other thing is those back seats are heated and these front chairs, well, they are heated and ventilated and the steering wheel is heated, very comfortable. But my favorite feature has to be these massaging chairs. This is by far one of the most affordable vehicles I've ever driven that has massaging seats and they work very well too. I'm finding all kinds of excuses to run errands this week just so I can spend more time in this driver's chair. But even though I said this is one of the most affordable vehicles I've ever driven with massaging chairs, that doesn't mean it's cheap. Now, I already covered the base price, so let's talk about the as-tested price of this one I'm driving. With all the extras that have been tacked on, this is a $65,000 vehicle before fees and taxes. That is a lot of money for a compact crossover. I know it's a luxury vehicle, but that is quite a bit of cash. Now, it is comparably priced to a Mercedes G. LC class, and it's a little bit cheaper than a Cadillac XT5 equipped the same way, but it's $10,000 more than a similarly equipped Acura RDX, and that is very hard to justify. But then again, there are some unique features in here, like these massaging chairs or this head up display. I really like head up displays, but this one in particular is great for one big reason all the features you can pull up on here, and my favorite has to be the simplest one. I can see when my signals are on. 
it is wonderful when you're out on the highway cruising around and you go to change lanes i like the fact that i can see my signal flashing on the windshield so i know that i've actually engaged my signal to let other drivers know i want to switch lanes very cool stuff i know it's simple but those are the niceties that really help to set a vehicle apart to recap, I like how comfortable the Lincoln Corsair is to cruise around in, the supple leather seats, and all the passenger space it offers. I don't like the cheap plastics inside, the somewhat cramped cargo area, or how expensive it gets with extras. If you're put off by the way performance has come to define the premium market, the Corsair should be refreshing at the very least. It's honest to goodness old school Lincoln luxury just wrapped up in a modern package. Unfortunately, some of the materials inside aren't quite up to the standards of a vehicle that costs this much, and it can get quite expensive once you start to add extras like those massaging seats or adaptive cruise control. But, and this is a very big caveat, not many vehicles out there keep it this simple when it comes to traditional luxury. So if that's what you're after, it just might be worth paying for.